could say that we're in the most defining decade of human history, right? There's so much at stake. So what does it mean when the most powerful and resourced and brilliant amongst us turn to the feathered and the finned and the furred for answers on the next big breakthrough? And that's really what I love about biomimicry. It's not what you'd expect. They're turning to the overlooked creatures, the stuff that we don't even take that seriously. They'll turn to termites for answers on self-cooling buildings, slug slime for surgical superglue, NASA's consulting with slime mold, a brainless one-celled organism for mapping the dark cosmos. It's fascinating. And the true masters of technology and innovation are everywhere. They're humble and they have nature's lab in common. Hello and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Linda Ulrich. We are interviewing people all over the world who are doing some of the most remarkable work, solving problems large and small, and they are putting a spring in our step. If you get used to joining us once a week, you are going to feel like anything's possible. And we're going to get started on that today with an amazing guest, Katie Losey. Katie is committed to bridging the gap between three important things in our future. Humans, I mean, we're all in this together, nature's genius, and breakthrough innovations. In short, she's all about overlooked wonder, one of my favorite topics. You know, Katie has worked at the intersection of business and conservation for over a decade, and she's gotten herself into some interesting situations which have given her the kind of insights we all need to go forward and learn from nature. She's locked eyes with gorillas in Rwanda. She's dodged rats in New York City and swam alongside orcas in uh, Norway, all in the course of this quest to help us find the possibilities of innovation inspired by nature. There's a whole study and landscape called biomimicry. And in that world, engineering doesn't have to just build on what humans have done. It actually builds insights from 4 billion years of R&D done by Mother Nature herself. We're going to go into a lot more of that. But Katie is going to be a great guide into this world of engineering and innovation that most of us have not heard enough about. Katie's been a member of the Explorers Club since 2015, and she serves on their public lecture, film, and World Oceans Week committee. She's been guest writing for the Biomimicry Institute since 2019, and her science writing has been featured in courses at the University of Cambridge, Johns Hopkins University, and on the cover story for the University of Richmond magazine, her alma mater. So this is going to be a fabulous conversation about possibility, and you will come away walking with a spring in your step. Welcome, Katie Losey. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> well, I tell you, um, you and I really stumbled into it when we first had our conversation about biomimicry. I'm not sure I've ever talked about this on the podcast, but I have a my second daughter, my middle daughter, has been a biomimicry nut since she was 13. And she won an award, a Global Innovation Award, and traveled to Panama with the Biomimicry Institute. Her love of this, this thing I mentioned in the opening about Mother Nature having done 4 billion years of research and development, <laughs> this is something she could see had a pathway forward for the world when she was 13 years old. And the rest of us are largely in the dark about biomimicry. So Katie, you know, I've explained my take on biomimicry and how I got there. Why don't you just take just a minute or two to tell us your take on biomimicry and how you got there? Yeah, I mean, so many people haven't heard of it. I was oblivious to it until about six years ago when I had an interaction with a slug that actually introduced me to biomimicry. But in a nutshell, it's looking, it's consciously looking at nature's genius for solutions and strategies to solve problems and create solutions. That's it, right? It's like, yeah. instead of all of us just sweating and trying to come up with something out of the blue to solve human problems or problems in the world, you know, it's it's likely that Mother Nature already solved that thing a billion years ago. A hundred percent. And it's just this idea that why are we locking ourselves into one species, humans? We have just 200,000 years on this planet. And how will that ever compete with 30 million species across 3.8 billion years of research and development and tinkering with their inherited traits? And um, they've come up with solutions that we could never come up with ourselves. So let's tap into that. 
Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, we can shift right into the reality here is that people like NASA, M- MIT, Bill Gates, they are looking to nature for answers. The people who have the resources and the real access to the best science in the world, even they are turning to biomimicry and folks who are, have expertise in this for answers to the big problems that they that they really care about. So catch us up on all that interest and and why should we care and all that. Yeah, you could say that we're in the most defining decade of human history, right? There's so much at stake. So what does it mean when the most powerful and resourced and brilliant amongst us turn to the feathered and the finned and the furred for answers on the next big breakthrough? And that's really what I love about biomimicry. It's it's not what you'd expect. They're not just turning to the obvious legends like the sharks and the elephants and the cheetahs and the whales. They're turning to the overlooked creatures, the stuff that we don't even take that seriously. We'll turn to termites for answers on self-cooling buildings, slug slime for surgical superglue. NASA's consulting with slime mold, a brainless one-celled organism (laughs) with the amount of neurons as a paper towel um, for mapping the dark cosmos. It's completely, it's fascinating. So yeah, there's so much I don't know to be true in the world, but I really believe that right now um, we need innovations that surpass, they upend the status quo and the true masters of technology and innovation are everywhere. They're humble and they have the nature's lab in common. And that's really mm-hmm. what this is all about. So, um, yeah, this, that yeah. is so beautifully said. Thank you for saying it just like that. I, if you see me going like this, you gave me goosebumps. When you gave those three quick examples, that's what I want people to understand. You know, we can look at slug slime for an answer to, you know, surgically closing wounds without stitches. I mean, there are billions of answers just waiting for us in nature like that. Yeah. And I think that we've kind of always pedestaled human beings and we've always kind of thought of ourselves. So many of us, obviously everyone, but so many of us have kind of um, pedestaled. We think that we're smarter, um, more intelligent. We have emotions that other animals and creatures don't have, but that's just not the case. And um, they also have just a skill set and strategies that we would never, you know, be able to get to without them. So I don't know. It really lights me up just thinking about kind of reframing the world and the the wild world in that way. Um, their allies, yeah. I like to give people um, some examples of what inspired me about biomimicry, and the quick ones I can think of off the top of my head was when I learned that the bullet train, the end of the bullet train. The nose of the bullet train was designed to cut through the air faster and lighten the drag on the train and so forth. Well, they used the beak of a kingfisher. The way the kingfisher dives and enters the water, that has so little drag on it that they they actually designed the, the front of the bullet train from that. Um, another one that I came across that I like to use as examples of what's possible is um, the fact that I, I, I think I've heard somewhere where we could be making the doorknobs in hospitals where yes. infection control is so important. We could be making that on a nanoparticle level like the skin of a shark because shark skin does not hold bacteria very well. Yes. I mean, those are my two big examples. I love those examples. What about you? What are your two favorite examples? Yeah. I'm going to riff off of two of your examples. Um, Okay. One, the shark skin uh, example is fantastic. And it was so good that they, you mentioned the spaceship. They actually brought that shark skin inspired adhesive to outer space because it was so good. So that like in a place where you're like, you need to be so thoughtful about every little thing that you have in there, they brought this material. So that's a huge endorsement for that shark skin adhesive. And then the, the I just learned this and I think the bullet train is such a cool example, of course, um, but it's also modeled after two other birds. Um, one being the owl. That's because they're having sound issues too. And owls are silent flyers. Like you can hear, there's certain birds like a hawk who actually may make noise to stun its prey. An owl wants to fly completely silently. And so they created these small serrations in the wing and applied that to the sides of the bullet train to make it quieter. And then they shaped the belly to be more like an Adeli penguin to lower wind resistance and make it more efficient. So those are two, I, I feel like those are two kind of lesser known parts to that example, but it's such a good one. Okay. So let's give people just who haven't run into this notion. I'm a science nerd, so I have, and I I never tire of this analogy, but talk to us about, you know, if the earth were a clock, talk to us about that, that analogy, or is it a calendar? 
I think maybe it'd be the calendar. Yeah, it's the three, 30, 365 day calendar. Yeah. Yes, that's the analogy. Tell us yeah. about that because that always that always puts our, my perspective where it ought to be. Yeah, no, it's so it's so fascinating. It's equally empowering and terrifying to consider our power and our impact when we look at this calendar year. It consistently blows my mind too. So, in essence, if Earth has been around for 4.5 billion years and we condense that into one calendar year. There are a few, I'll share some milestones um, just to give you perspective. January 1st, Earth is born. February 25th, the first life appears. Fast forward to March 28th, that's when photosynthesis begins. Um, Fast forward to November, that's when the first insects, fungi, fish, land plants appear. December 26th, an asteroid strikes um, and that's when dinosaurs go extinct. Now we're at December 31st, 11.36 p.m., primates appear. And December 31st, 11.59 p.m., two seconds before midnight is when the Industrial Revolution started. So that's just, it gives me chills because it's the fact that we've been here for the, again, those 200,000 years versus the millions of years of life on the planet who have endured and not only endured, but also thrived on this planet. Um, and think about consider what we're what we're doing in the state of the state the news what's going on in the world right now so it's just kind of this reframe of like how can we learn from this web of life and just like kind of reframing things as like this the natural world isn't a warehouse of goods there are mentors there are allies and i just think that beyond the strategies of course like you know they've passed these hardcore natural selection tests over millions of years but it's also they're creating conditions conducive to life for all life for the long haul. And that's true progress. And um, yeah, I just think it's, it's really important to, (laughs) it's it's a humbling calendar, but it's, it's very sobering. But the good news is that this kind of this climate chaos, this situation that we found ourselves in is bringing up, it's kind of rearing new levels of gumption and ingenuity and heart that um, goes across engineers and artists and politicians and students. So we can innovate ourselves out of this. That's up to us. Yeah. If that is such a lovely, that's such a lovely way to say it is that it's, it's all about creating progress for everything, not just humans. Like that's the way nature work things out. It, it, that's such a great point. How about, you know, this bridging concept? I love that about, about when I read that in my research about your work, you've got this way of thinking that there can be a bridge between technology and biology, which a lot of people don't think about too much or, or yeah. design and, and solutions. Talk to us about this bridging concept. Yeah. I mean, I always have kind of thought of, since learning about biomimicry, I've thought of it as kind of you're bridging biology and technology, but you're bridging so many other things too, right? You're bridging biology and innovation, conservationists and tech wizards, eons, disciplines, the skinned, the scaled, the finned, you know, you're bringing all these things that kind of, so often we operate in silos, that siloed thinking, working in isolation, quarantining ideas, patenting ideas, and kind of nature's open source, right? So, and if we want true progress, we have to do something that we haven't done before. And I really think that includes the simple kind of idea. It's like the simple, simple radical act of cross-pollination and sharing ideas between species and industries and disciplines, corporates, biologists, indigenous people um, who have been practicing this way for thousands of years, engineers, governments. So yeah, I think it's it's that idea that in addition to kind of with biomimicry, you're thinking of like almost talking interspecies st- talking, but it's almost like you're talking to humans that you've never talked to before too. And that's such a beautiful bridge. And you also said the words like practical solutions and true progress. And I think that's like, I think a huge part of this for me is that biomimicry, you're, these ideas, these strategies, these recipes, these solutions, the origin of them are the voiceless. They're honoring the voiceless. They're protecting the voiceless. There are these practical solutions that are not just human-centric, but they're life-centric. They're not just money-centric. They're life-centric. It's such a cool discipline because, and that just this practice, because it's, it doesn't lean on altruism, but it's innovation that's rooted in integrity. Um, so I think that that, the, that combo leads to true progress for the long haul. And yeah, so it's just, you know, <laughs> that's... 
That's lovely. Uh, yeah. It's very yeah. well said. It's very well said. Again, you've, you know, you've obviously got a gift to your wordsmith, your uh, writer, and you've just got a Thank gift you. for boiling this down to some really foundational concepts. One of the things you got, you and I decided on when we were chatting in our pre-call was that biomimicry is one of those topics that speaks to the brain. What gets you involved in it, what got me involved in it was to see my 13 year old daughter who just is a, a, a crazy science mind. I'm going to put a bunch of links to her work yeah. um, in the show notes. She, she had a patent on a new kind of wind turbine by age 21 that was based on the, the locomotion of a cuttlefish. I mean, to have these kinds of ideas in this brain that naturally goes like that, it is, is a gift. But I'm sure the world is full of children who think like that and who ideate like that, that maybe somehow our rigid education system is sort of shutting that notion of possibility down too soon. So yeah. I want you to talk about this concept of how it biomimicry tends to speak to the brain, but mm. it also embodies our heart for the world and the future. Yeah, no, I love this question. I love it because so many of us think of ourselves as these incredibly rational beings and we're, you know, we're taught to live from the neck up, right? We're taught to focus on facts and science and data and proof. And I believe in all those things. Yes, I 100% do. And there's a reason why hardcore industrialists and engineers and academics are so focused on biomimicry because we have all of that at our back. But we also need to give credit and honor our hearts in this equation too. You can't deny chills or stop your heart from beating and like getting excited about something. You feel that in your bones. And that type of understanding, like that's something that you can go for a walk in the woods. It's like this kind of firsthand learned experience is just as sacred and valuable as anything that a textbook will teach you and that our rational minds can make sense of. So I think that's a really big, I like, I just love this question because there's a huge difference between thinking and really knowing. And that's at the heart of what biomimicry is, right? It's this, it's both. It's so highly practical and solution oriented, and it makes you dizzy with wonder and awe and just like, well, how is this, you know, it makes you believe in something more. It does for me. So yeah, I think that, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and that's what I noticed in my daughter. And that's why I really dove in myself because, you know, I, I get on her laptop and, you know, what most 13 year old girls were looking at was just all about their presence in social media. Mm. And this kid had every single biomimicry video there was on the internet teed up so that she could just like endlessly <laughs> How cool. I wish I, oh my gosh. Right. She has her. Her own, <laughs> yes. And I think that, did you run across her, her own little video series she made uh, when she was in college, the nature nerd? Yes. I actually, you know, when we, you initially reached out to me, I did some yeah. digging into, to your daughter and um, yeah, I found her site nature like, i think yeah it was called like nature, nature nerd or something like yeah and i yeah. it's like kind of what I, I call myself the same thing i love i felt an instant connection to her but i i also admire so much like if i had i mean i found out about this idea of biomimicry like five six years ago and i just wonder what my life how things would have shifted like i've really loved the course of my life and many you know but of course I wonder how things would have been different if i had been exposed to biomimicry as a discipline at you know, in high school. Um, I'm, I'm jealous and I just, it's yeah. so wonderful. Well, yeah. I, and she did become an engineer and she yeah. is, she is looking and working in the world with that same mindset, not, not where, right where she ought to be yet, but you don't get to start where, right where you want. You know, she's doing some amazing things, but I bring that up over and over again, because um, one of the things she taught me was the possibilities that open up when we start nurturing, and you just mm -hmm. brought it up too, when we start nurturing the little unique alchemy in young people as early as possible on topics like this, gosh knows what's, what's yeah. possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you said this in beautiful thing when we were talking in the pre-call, you said there is nothing more elegant and coded with possibility than nature. Mm. And I think that's what young minds are, are really tuned in to notice the elegant simplicity of things that are obvious to them. And so, so not obvious to us. Talk about this elegant coded possibility in nature. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to answer this. I'm going to try to answer this question with a question that helps paint the picture for me. So Linda, what would you say is the strongest biological material on earth? Stronger well, than steel, stronger than Kevlar, the stuff that Bulletproof Vests are made from. Spider webs. 
good good answer but no it used it but for a long time they thought it was spider webs okay spider silk no um, which is five times stronger than steel um ounce per ounce but it's the tooth of a limpet and if you don't know what a limpet is it's that uh it's an ocean creature they um they are, have actually have a shell here they sit like a little, little, yeah, little this flat, is a, rounded cap. It's right? kind of like a conical shell. This is a limpet shell. So you've probably passed them hundreds of times, never thought twice. But this organism makes this the strongest material, biological material on Earth at room temperature without extra heat, without emissions, without destroying its natural habitat. So to the idea that if you think about how we make steel, <laughs> The amount of heat and pressure and destruction that goes into that. This limpet is making something that surpasses that material and is supporting the life around it. And to me, that's true elegance <laughs> and just such a beauty. And you mentioned spider silk. Spider silk is five times stronger than steel and lighter than a leaf, right? So it's so impressive how, you know, to consider how the spinnerets, the spider spinnerets are in the bellies of these spiders. They're again working at room temperature without chemicals. The only byproduct is water. And it's just like, these are beautiful examples because they typify nature working quietly, humbly, hyper-efficiently, elegantly, and just like so simple. (laughs) It's so beautiful. we just, we just have to ask better questions. I mean, like, we are not asking enough questions. Like so it's kind of like <laughs> I have, I hate to use this analogy, but in another episode, which I'll put um, in the show notes, I talked to a really important um, materials scientist, marketing woman named Brandy Parker, unbelievable conversation. And we couch the whole discussion in this concept of spaceship earth. Like we, are on a spaceship together. We are on this planet floating through space. We have everything that we have. We're not going to get any more stuff. We've got all that we've got. And when I, what I love about what you're saying and what biomimicry causes us to do is, is exactly if we were in trouble on a spaceship, we would start to look around at what we have, right? We have what, as far as we know, all we're going to have. And if we look at those resources as limited, finite, but start rummaging around in what's already here, we could have the answer to almost all our problems. No. Right, Laura knows this whole. hundred percent. To consider the possibilities when we bring the biological kingdom to the design table, we'd be nuts not to access that collective knowledge. I think you mentioned this woman as a was in... Um, fashion. But if you like the fashion industry uses more energy than the aviation and shipping sectors combined, it's 2 billion metric tons of greenhouse gases per year. So imagine if the fashion industry started taking cues from spiders and, um, and limpets for, you know, to create their materials. It's just, it's really quite interesting. Yeah. Let's go to a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk some more about all these natural wonders. And hopefully we'll get you inspired to start looking around your world with a new sense of possibility. You know how the constant negative noise in our digital lives feels like it's reaching a boiling point? Now, many of us have tuned out the news and social media almost entirely. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. There are newsworthy stories about amazing progress, innovation, leaps in human potential, and wonders in the natural world, and they're just not reaching the top of our feeds. We can have access to this, but none of us has the time or maybe even the emotional stamina to search through all the doom and gloom news to find what's right with the world. Okay, enter the goodness exchange. There, we are giving instant access to positive news for curious people. Did you hear about the recent Harvard study that found that exposure to just four minutes of good news can make you 32% less anxious and 18% more optimistic? Well, I don't know about you, but I need those kind of numbers in my life. So if you want to live with more joy and way less fear, it's really simple. First, you join us at the Goodness Exchange. Everyone around the world has the opportunity to access this kind of content. And we promise no politics for about a decade, so you're safe from all that distraction as well. Second, you allow this new 
more positive, balanced worldview to put a spring in your step again. It can change the way you react to your kids, your coworkers, everybody you come in contact with. And the stories we write about can make you the idea person in your circles. These challenging times call for us to wake up and take control of our perspective. The people who use the goodness exchange have the ability to react to the harshness of the world much different because they know way more about what's right with the world. And that's a resource. So subscribe to the goodness exchange, our YouTube channel and the podcast, and use this content to live a more expansive worldview. It is still an amazing world out there and you can be a part of it. Welcome to the conspiracy of goodness. Okay, we're back, and I have to um, I have to have Katie talk to us about this journey she's been on because you are a non scientist. Like you talk with so much um, acumen about this topic that it's easy to think that you also had studied the details of biomimicry since you were thirteen. But you you have a great story, and, and this non scientist part of the topic I think makes you a great translator. Talk to us a little bit about that. No, I'm jealous of your daughter, but I'm I'm a person curious about scientists, and I have a, a lifelong reverence for the natural world, but I'm not a biologist or a chemist or an engineer or a physicist. And for a long time, I felt I was on the back foot because of that and just felt like I didn't kind of deserve to be speaking about biomimicry. But more recently, I've kind of settled into that role of being a bridge yeah. that we spoke about earlier and really connecting like being a connector of the biology, the technology, the wonder. And I see so quickly how if people talk over people's heads, it's easy to kind of tap out and just feel like, oh, like this isn't for me. And they can check out, understandably. But I hopefully can kind of distill it into kind of more consumable, compelling concepts that help people kind of grasp it and understand it and then kind of get more excited about it. So, yeah, like, so I, yeah, I, I, I want to support the scientists like your daughter and the startups um, screaming to the rooftops about their innovations and technologies. But just as much of just as important, I think that it's like trying to break through to the students that are barely paying attention in class or the hardcore corporates, the parents, the nature nerds. So, yeah. And it's, it's interesting. Like I don't never, I don't really know where my, what's, what's going to land, what's going to hit with people when I write about a topic. And we obviously, we, met through one of the articles I wrote called The Bizarre Genius of a Brainless Blob about, about slime molds. But it's been so wild to think about what the, the notes and letters that I've received pe from people that are excited about it and just like that they're trying to incorporate it into their work. Like, for instance, there's a woman, she's in sustainable development. She's one of Bloomberg's public innovation champions. She's pioneering this, or she's trying to like pioneer the economic development for a city in Brazil, but she's in the government and she shared that article with her colleagues to get inspirations for their next capital infrastructure project. How cool. Wow. Yeah. There's like a STEAM educator wow. who sits on the board of the National Science Foundation. She wants to, and inspired her to like, she wants to bring it into the curriculum for her schools. Or there's a, somebody that he worked at a think tank and he was like, we need a biomimic on our team. We need people in the, at the design table. And this article made me rethink that. So I was just like, this is, mm -hmm. this is really great. And you just don't know, kind mm -hmm. of like, I'm, I'm not a scientist and I don't claim to be, I'm, um, I'm not a biomimicry expert. You know, I just, I'm yeah. really intrigued by it. I, I admire it. I love it. Um, but I'm so quick to kind of be clear on that because it's incredible kind of like just trying to put yourself out there and seeing what happens. And it, that's been a, a beautiful kind of learning around this as well. In addition to the kind of the wonder and the strategies, it's just like, just try, <laughs> put yourself out there, see what happens. Yeah. To that point, I completely forgot how we met, but I read that article <laughs> and I contacted you. Yeah. That's what happened. And yeah. Because I, we have written about slime mold. Okay. So first I need to let people know that if they see me taking notes and waving around a pen, I'm taking really careful notes because there will be a beautiful article about this complete way more complete than you can find on Spotify or Apple tunes or what have you, but there'll be a complete article about this and every single thing that, that uh, Katie and I have referenced will be in that article. So we'll put a link to the article we're talking about in the show notes and the article at the goodness exchange under the conspiracy of goodness podcast there. And I'll also put there some links to the articles that we've written on the goodness exchange about slime mold because mm. slime mold is this, <laughs> 
all the rage. It's all the rage. It's the rage in the world. Yeah. And it, it reminds me, if you could please, it's not the same as, but it, it talks your story about the slug. It's just a window into the kind of wonder that things like slime mold and spider silk and, <laughs> and uh, tell us the story about the slug. Um, yeah, I mean, this is rewinding decades, but you know, that my like some of the most formative parts of my childhood really, you know, you think about your parents and your friends and your teachers. Um, but one of the most formative forces was the stream behind my house. I would go down there and I don't know, I knew every rock, all the rocks that wobble to avoid so you don't like twist an ankle. I knew where the minnows, where to find the minnow pockets. I knew where to, you know, how to catch a crayfish with my hands. Like, I just loved that place. And um, about six years ago, I brought my niece back down there just to, you know, it's such a part of my childhood. Um, and we were playing in the stream. We, you know, encountered a slug as you do. We were playing with it. And, you know, hours later, I was like, after the fifth or sixth time of trying to wash the slug slime off my hands, I said to Atlee, I was like, listen, I promise you, this is going to be the invention of something one day. Like, this is such the stubborn slime. We cannot get it off our hands. It has to be behind some invention. And then I kid you not, hours later, we're listening to Guy Raz on NPR. He has this incredible kids program called Wow in the World. And they were talking about how slug slime is informing a new surgical super glue. And it just like, it was one of those like hit you over the head. Like, okay, this is, I, you know, you have an idea of what biomimicry is because you see planes in the air. Obviously there's like these more obvious examples, but I'd never heard the word um, used in that way. And it just kind of completely opened me up to a whole new world and of just like wonder, awe, solutions. And just like, again, that idea of just like bridging the conservation and the futuristic technology is just something that really struck a chord with me. So that's, that's the slug story. <laughs> that's the slug that's, story. That's how it goes. Yeah, that's once how it happens. Start, I tell you, once you start kind of keeping your ears open for this whole topic of biomimicry and innovation you'll start seeing things or coming up with your own like oh i wonder about this or what if that and it's yeah. a lovely place to just be in your mind um a beautiful elegant place to be in your mind almost childlike again yeah with a sense of possibility and i love it i love yeah. that example i love that slug introduced me to biomimicry because it was a perfect example of flipping the status quo on its head humbling our egos finding answers where you'd never think you would ever find them and just revering something that you normally just would completely disregard or overlook. Yeah. So I, I love that. I love that one. It's a lifesaver. <laughs> like a slug could save your life. It's yeah, so cool. huge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So then, then there's this topic that people may be hearing a little bit more that's so well connected to biomimicry that I think we can give people another way into the topic. So I interviewed an amazing man um, named Paul Hawken, who is who is the creator of the I think it's still the world's most comprehensive yeah. climate change mitigation program called Project Drawdown. Yes, the Bible. Uh, but, I love it. Yes, yes the Bible of yeah. climate change mitigation. Right. Mm. And um, I interviewed him quite a long time ago, maybe about a year and a half ago. He's amazing. He's got a new book coming out in May. So I hope to get on his list. He's on my to-do list to, to contact. I'll put that in the show notes because in that interview, we didn't even mention product project drawdown once. What he was starting to get very interested in, like all innovators, he's running ahead of us all, was the topic of regeneration. I had not heard that word um, mentioned and I'm a, I'm, I keep track of what's going on in the media for obvious reasons, because I'm searching for good news all the time. But uh, it was new back then. And so we spent the entire beautiful episode on this concept of regeneration. So I'd like you to speak to that a little bit, because regeneration is sort of fundamentally linked to biomimicry for the reasons that you mentioned about half an hour ago, that the way to really live a regenerative lifestyle and create a regenerative world is just look at what nature was doing, because that's what it was doing all along. Mm, yeah. Talk to us about your thoughts. First of all, I, I love Paul Hawken as well. And um, so that, yeah, his book, Project Drawdown, has really been a Bible for me for the last six years. But yeah, the way that I think about it, and I'm not an expert, but the way that I think about it is sustainability is really just not causing harm, right? So, and I see regenerative as going beyond that, focusing on designs and technology solutions that leave things better 
So yeah, it's just going from like for, you know, our interactions with planet Earth, it's not degrading, it's really helping the planet heal itself. If we take the built world, for example, there's this a crazy statistic, but our built world, the building stock will double by 2060. So that means the equivalent of a new New York City will be built every month until 2060. And so considering that concrete will be the most consumed stuff on the planet after water, it'll be a beast of carbon dioxide emissions and concrete's not going anywhere. We need to make it better, right? But there are solutions. And with biomimicry, there's solutions. For example, with coral, it's possible that we can have sidewalks and buildings that actually store carbon dioxide and actively sequester the air pollution that's wreaking havoc on our planet, cleaning up the air we breathe and storing it in these structures. Um, And this is not like a far off crazy concept. It's something that's commercial. It's here today. If you go to San Francisco's Terminal 1, um, their airport, you can see this in real life. (laughs) It's there. So it's really mimicking spiny corals carbon mineralization process and using carbon as a building block. So I think that's such a great example of regeneration because it's using the built world. It's actually having it behave and actually help protect us. And I think that's just a kind of a reframe, you think, which was, it was new for me. It's almost like this topic of, we can stop trying to charge, charge, charge forward to get what we want, what we need to have more comfort, all that. And instead, I'm not saying we're, what all my guests that I've ever talked to on this topic tell me that if we get creative, we don't have to give up the comfort part of our lives to Mm -hmm. save the planet, Mm -hmm. but we've got to get awfully creative. Mm -hmm. And there's this emulating part like we can emulate nature and come to new places that we can't possibly imagine tell us about this quote you and i landed on from carl sagan about stardust carl i just finished his series cosmos cosmos i don't have you seen it oh oh, i was i saw it the original time when it you know think about how long ago that was carl died in 1993 Mm, so cosmos was probably in the 80s i'm sure mid 80s something like that yeah I think and it I came remember. out 1980 yeah yeah we never missed an episode it was well, something course. and it easily accessed right now and just as meaningful so we'll yeah. put that in show notes too. yeah yeah I was just listening to a talk I'm going to this conference called Bioneers at the end of March and I was listening to this talk by this guy from his name is David Mc Conville from the Buckminster Fuller Institute and he said we're part of the universe we're not the center of the universe And I thought that that kind of tapped into that idea of like Carl Sagan's We Are Stardust. It's such a lovely, again, reframe, because sometimes what we fail to acknowledge is that what science has already confirmed is that we are nature. We're the natural world. We are animals. And that remembering really changes things. There's this intense and uncomfortable and beautiful vulnerability and smack you in the face kind of acknowledgement that of our interdependence and interconnectedness, which is you know, an incredible thing. But I think that oftentimes we think of ourselves as separate and we're not. So yeah, that bond is just, it's, it's everything and kind of taking it, taking it into a different direction. I was listening to another, a woman that was in my biomimicry course at the um, Arizona State University. Her name is Azita Artakani. She's a philanthropist, entrepreneur, fellow biomimicry, lifelong student. But she mentioned to me, or she mentioned on this podcast, I thought it was so interesting, this idea that Species don't try to be something that they're not. Uh, like an organism's brilliance is in the majesty of it being itself, and our collective evolution hinges on them being themselves. And I love this idea and concept. I'm very much into kind of self, you know, evolution and becoming the brightest, best version of yourself. And oftentimes, that's removing all the conditioning of trying to be something that you're not to try to please others. You know, a butterfly doesn't try to be a snail. A raven doesn't try to be a a shark. Um, And this idea of humans radically being ourselves and just kind of stepping into that is such a, it's like a lifelong work, right, for all of us. And I think that there's something about just remembering that, like, we are part, we have an inherent right to be here. And we are part of this, like, magic, magical, majestic, unbelievable world. It strengthens that bond that Carl was talking about. <laughs> I'm not going to do any of this justice, but the, yeah, but, um, but we will, yeah. we will send people in a lot of directions. Uh, first and foremost, we will send people to the biomimicry Institute. Let's make sure we talk a, a, a good little bit about that because that's, that's like almost next step for people in my mind. I, I get their newsletter. I never miss it. I would never just hit delete on that. I 
every time I dive into it, I got a spring in my step afterwards. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I just feel this overwhelming sense of wonder. And then there's, of course, Janine uh, Benius's uh, remarkable TED Talk. How long ago did she do that TED Talk? Mm, I think she's done a few now. I, I yeah, mean, yeah, decades, yeah, yeah. decades. Dec <laughs> the, fir the very first one that probably was the one that, that Louisa landed on and I. So we're going to give people the links to that because if you want to really be drawn in in a powerful way and all of a sudden be up to speed, it's it's Janine who is charting the course forward for this advocacy for biomimicry. Would you agree with that? 100%. I mean, I feel like she's the known as like kind of the godmother of biomimicry. Obviously, biomimicry has been around for thousands of years. Um, indigenous people have been practicing it yeah. for, again, eons. But she's really the person that her book kind of coined the term and she kind of brought it to life for people that had never heard of this, this concept before, including yeah. um, Dana Baumaster, who she, uh, they work together, Biomimicry Institute, Biomimicry 3.8. Um, and they've kind of been in it together mm -hmm. since the earliest of days. So, yeah. Okay. We'll make sure that there's links there for just people who are just naturally curious like me, people that are in engineering. If you're if you're in engineering and you catch this podcast and you haven't heard of the world of biomimicry and engineering, you got to dive in because you'll be the person with the ideas in your workplace. Um, but also, if folks have kids, like I said, it changed Louise's life to be a part of the biomimicry's program and all the support she got and the travel. And there's a lot there. If this, was she part like of the topic. accelerator program? Yes. Yes. Yeah. She was part of the accelerator so program cool. all through all through college. And she wow. did graduate with a patent on this crazy turbine. Okay. And uh, it's just waiting for someone to pick up this idea and use it in tides to create tidal energy, which could be in rivers off to the side and have no negative effects. It's a great idea. It's just waiting for someone to help her pick it up and run with it. Um, okay. So one of the things we, we can't get away without asking is, you know, what do you really wish people knew? Like there's so much you and I could go on talking for another hour, but you know, I always like my guests kind of near the end to boil things down. Like when you look at the news or you see the quandaries that our world is in, if you had only had three minutes and, and, and that's it, you share something. What do you, what, what does this, this world, this life you've led taught you? What do you really wish people knew? Um, well, one, we kind of just hinted at it, but just remembering that we are nature, we are animals. It's not scenery. It's not a postcard. It's not the weather. I believe that's very empowering and humbling and an essential part of all of this. So that's one. Two, I'm, I'm on a little bit of a mission to de-pedestal humans. And I don't mean that as a threat. I think it's, it's quite a tonic and makes the world that much more fascinating and interesting when we recognize that we're not the only species that feel emotions or have a unique intelligence. You know, for example, like elephants can die of a broken heart. They mourn. They can pick, they pick up the bones of, the, of their relatives or loved ones who have passed and literally mourn. <laughs> a Venus fly, I just learned yesterday on a TED, TED Talk that a Venus flytrap can count. A plant can count. Just so crazy. But there's just, there's so much of this wonder out there. And I just feel like it's, we'd all do better, like, uh, we're all better for it if we kind of tap into that. Like, even monarch butterflies, whose bodies are so delicate, they can literally rub off on a flower petal or your hands. They can navigate all the way from Canada all the way back to Mexico, down to the same tree that their great-grandparents lived on, even though they've never been there before. <laughs> it's just like these wildly magical, fascinating things that the world is full of, but we're just like, we're, we're completely zoned out or numbed out or not paying attention. And I want people to like, I want people to pay attention to those things and know that they're there for them. Mm. Um, and everyday people, right? Like the other yeah. day, I, I have a part of our farm that we'd like to take down some trees and put in a pond. And um, so I had some foresters over and they're chainsaw guys and that, you know, they, that's, that's their world is, is helping people treat their woods like a garden sort of. But they were absolutely full of wonder when I brought this subject of trees talking to each other. Yeah. Up. Yes. I mean, if you don't know that topic, there's some amazing books out there on the fact that we know trees are talking to each other. And we've done some articles on the topic, so I'll be sure and share those in the show notes too. But my point is, is that these are two everyday people that had stumbled upon this notion on their own. 
and of course it's right in line with what they do every day. And they actually threw in some concepts while we were talking about which trees we'd take down and which not that were related to this. And they were really thinking it through. It was biomimicry and the topic of knowing more about nature allows us to be more expansive in our own knowledge base, no matter what we do. I I really believe that. It's so interesting. It makes you more interesting and interested in the world. So it's a huge gift. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, what do people have, what, what should people do next? If this, you know, if, if this wonderful impact that you and I have just talked about for an hour were to sweep through engineering and three, sweep through the innovation world, what, what does it happen to make that kind of change? Because there will be a lot of people that catch this episode and they have never heard the words biomimicry. And that's such a shame. What has to happen next? Yeah. I mean, to your point, we need more nature nerds. We need people to talk yeah. about it. We need more tech wizards. We need people to talk about it. I want, I'm want. i on a mission to help make biomimicry a household name. And um, that could be, you know, like what we're doing right now. Invite people on a podcast, have people over for dinner, talk to people at your book club. You know, it doesn't, you know, t- uh, have someone a speaker at your kid's school. Um, there's just so many, it just, it needs to become something that is more mainstream. How about books that you recommend? Do you have some books that are like, mm, just to get- I actually have. Uh, my computer's sitting on one. Uh, featherproof, uh, bulletproof feathers. This is one. Um, hold up, hold it up a little bit more towards your camera so people can get can it just to the. Yeah, there you go. This is an old library copy that I probably yeah. It's overdue. Podcasts are there? Are there any podcasts that are specifically yeah, focused on biomimicry? One, there's just one with. Um, Actually, it's called the regenerative mm. uh, something regenerative. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can send it, it to it you. We will but look it's it up with it's it like it yeah, it's a really good primer. It's with uh, Janine Venius and Dana Biomaster. Okay. Oh, it, um, oh, so it's, it's and that's a very special one since they're both together. One of my you know f- former classmates, Azita Artakani. She's if you just put plug her name into um, okay. Spotify, she has a few that are really lovely just like such a kind of like she really tugs at that heart element of biomimicry. Just, it's not just the practical emulation. It's the ethos piece. It's the reconnect piece that are also essential elements to um, it's like revering the organisms and just having that, that important bond with nature are essential elements. Because if you think about it, they were talking about, you know, if you look at a a plane in the sky, like let's say 1913, and they talk about it on this podcast with Janine. But you know, they you know you invent the the plane; it's, it's emulating a bird. Wonderful. But then, like a decade later, they're dropping bombs out of the sky with that plane. So, right. is that really biomimicry? If you're, it's like it's what's the end goal here? Is it benefiting? Is it creating conditions conducive to life for all life? And you know, there's that moral piece of it that's really kind of key yeah. to the to the um, whole comprehensive look Mm -hmm. at what biomimicry really is. So reminds um, me of a a conversation I had just yesterday that I recorded with an amazing man, Kyle Dodson. And I'll tell you, he talked about something that you just reminded me of. We have these choices, you know, we have the invention of the airplane based off the way birds flies. And then somehow we wound up using that technology to drop bombs. But Kyle talks about our choices in, being a part of virtuous circles or virtuous cycles and vicious cycles. This is, I think what you're talking about is biomimicry and regenerative lifestyles. And all those, those conversations are all about being part of virtuous cycles Yeah, and anything else that takes us astray. Usually it's anything that's really self-focused on the human uh, well, existence yeah, takes us into the vicious cycles. It gets like what we we're talking about, like those short-term gains that are not, right. it's, they're not true progress. Like we use those words, true progress. It's, it's not true progress if it's <laughs> killing off our planet or yeah. I mean, you get it. It's so, yeah. 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 Well, I tell you, thank you so much for this fabulous interview. You, you have a way of, with words that I admire and envy, and I can't thank you enough for all the preparation you did for this interview and just the thoughtfulness that at which you're um, applying your gifts in this, in this world um, and helping to elevate the biomimicry Institute to, to greater acclaim and, and usefulness. I think it's just a win-win for the world. So oh, thank you so much. Thank you Katie so much. Losey. I really appreciate it. I know this is a topic so close to both of our hearts and I hope that 
I did it justice. Um, oh, and I'm just so you. grateful that you reached out. It's it's like just such a, another great example of this bridge that biomimicry just brings together people that this is just a wonderful conversation. And I'm grateful that I had the chance to speak to you. So thank you, Linda. And um, all right, lovely. I'll, I'll, I'll hope to connect with Janine at some point in the yeah. future as well. Yes. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. I hope the insights that uh, Katie and I shared with you today put a spring in your step and you have a week that full of wonder and the kind of observations and questions and sense of joy that we've been talking about for the last hour. Thank you so much. Thank you.